Will you kindly stand for the singing of our national anthem? wonderful and momentous occasion for the city of Brockton. I don't want to say my age, but I can never remember a sitting U.S. Senator coming for a town hall to the city of Brockton. So we are extraordinarily lucky to have our Senator Markey here with us today. Uh, I would like to introduce on the stage with me uh, my very good friend and colleague, Representative Jer Jerry Cassidy. I, d I didn't say my own name, Representative Claire Cronin, and we're also joined with my other good friend, Representative Michelle Dubois, who is here today. <laughs> Senator Markey, what I first want to say about him is, even though he's a senator in Washington, he is very, very responsive to the needs of this community. I reached out to him a little while ago uh, with a constituent that had a federal issue that needed his attention, and within one week's time, Senator Markey arranged for us to come down to Washington, meet with him, so if people say that they don't listen to us in Washington, they don't hear us, when it comes to Senator Markey, that is ex exactly the opposite of the truth. And he has been so responsive Every time the offices reach out to him, they get back to us right away and they're eager to help the people in this district. So I'm not going to go on a little more about that because the duty of introducing Senator Markey is going to our mayor, Mayor Bill Carpenter from the city of Brockton. So come on over. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this beautiful War Memorial building, and we're thrilled to have you all here with us uh, this afternoon. Before I have the pleasure of introducing the senator, they've given me the distinction of introducing and recognizing a uh, large list of elected officials who are here with us this afternoon. So I'm going to do the best I can, and hopefully I've, I've got everybody. First, from the Southeastern Regional School Committee today, we have Mark Lindy and Tony Branch are both here with us. <laughs> Representing the Mass Nurses Association, Lisa Field is here. Plymouth County Registrar of Deeds, John Buckley, is with us today. From the Randolph Town Council, Natasha Clerge is here from Randolph. The Superintendent of Schools in the Town of Easton, Leisha Cabral, is with us today. Also from our neighbors in Easton, select person Dottie Fulginetti is with us also. <laughs> Representing the Democratic City Committee, their newly elected chair, Deborah Garland, is here today. 
We have uh, some great friends from the professional firefighters. First, from the professional firefighters of Massachusetts, Bill Cabral, Secretary Treasurer, is here. And from Local 144, Archie Gormley and Bill Hill are both here with us today. From the Brockton School Committee, first our Superintendent of Schools, Kathleen Smith, is here with us. And also joining us from the Brockton School Committee, Brett Gormley, Tim Sullivan, Lisa Plant, and Mark D'Agostino are all here. Thank you for being here. We have, uh, I think we have more than a quorum of the Brockton City Council here today, uh, so I'll try to make sure I don't leave anyone out. Uh, from the Brockton City Council, Ward 2 Councilor Tom Monahan, <laughs> Councilor at Large Wynn Farwell, Ward 5 Councilor Ann Beauregard, Ward 4 Councilor Susan Nicastro, Ward 7 Councilor Shirley Asak, Jack Lally, Councilor from Ward 6, and then Councilors at Large Bob Sullivan, Moises Rodriguez, and Jean Bradley Derenencourt are all here. So we truly appreciate everyone being here, and, and uh, I have to echo Claire's sentiments as what a great day this is for the city of Brockton to have a sitting United States Senator choose to come here to the City of Champions to hold an open forum, open town hall with the residents of Brockton. So, Senator, thank you for coming today. I have to tell you that uh, I had my first opportunity to meet the senator a couple months after being elected mayor. In March of 2014, uh, Senator Markey called a summit in the city of Taunton to address what went then was just the exploding overdose crisis, opioid overdose crisis. And he brought national uh, drug czar and national officials from DC, invited local political leaders from around southeastern Massachusetts, and he took a position then right at the front in leading the way in fighting the opioid epidemic. And that fight goes on today, and Senator Markey has continued to fight that fight for us every day. And for that, we're thankful, Senator. So as Claire mentioned, Senator Markey and his staff have been champions for the City of Champions. Uh, the Senator and I have the opportunity to, to meet at least three or four times a year. In my four years as mayor, this is the Senator's third official visit to the city of Brockton. He's toured our schools, he's toured our downtown, and now he's here to speak directly with the residents. So uh, Senator Markey really has truly been a friend uh, to the City of Champions, and he's always been responsive to our local issues, most recently supporting us in obtaining uh, federal HUD funding for lead pain abatement here in the city, funding that we had been seeking for years and finally obtained this year with the support of Senator Markey. So Senator, thank you and your staff for your efforts on that as well. But the Senator is a leader who's not afraid to take on the tough national issues while taking care of things at home. And watching him lead in the Senate, fighting the opioid crisis, fighting for net neutrality, fighting for immigration reform, fighting for reasonable gun laws. He has not been afraid to take on the most controversial and challenging issues, and particularly in the times of this current administration. So for me, it is a great thrill and a great honor to officially welcome to the city of Brockton United, United States Senator Ed Markey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your Great service to the city of Brockton. Thank you all for coming out here on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so I, again, I thank the mayor for hosting me here today in uh, Brockton. As he said, uh, we've met uh, and talked about the Brockton schools. We've talked about the opioid crisis. We've talked about policing issues, we've talked about community development issues, it's both here and in Washington, D.C. Uh, we keep meeting and talking about how the federal government, how my office can help the city of Brockton continue on this incredible journey. And uh, 
Unemployment right now in Brockton is 5.1%. It's down to one of the lowest rates it's been in a generation. Uh, but we're still not happy, right? Even at 5.1. And, uh, but it continues to go down. Uh, and that's the direction in which we want to send it. Um, the mayor tells me that over 90% of the graduates of Brockton High School last year went on to higher education or into the military. That's 90% here in Brockton, okay? And we're still not happy. We still know we have a lot of work to do. So it is my great honor to be partnered with the mayor in helping uh, this city uh, and helping to advance an agenda which ensures that there is a democratization of access to opportunity uh, for every child in our country through health care uh, and educational uh, access. So we, we thank you all for being here. Uh, for Claire Cronin, uh, we thank you, Claire, uh, for your leadership. Last week, uh, the most comprehensive criminal justice reform in a generation passed. Claire Cronin, <laughs> Claire Cronin is the... Uh, Claire Cronin is the heavyweight champion of criminal justice reform to make the system more fair. So we thank you, Claire. We thank you for being here. Uh, Jerry Cassidy. Jerry Cassidy has kind of channeled um, Senator Kennedy, Senator Tom Kennedy's uh, commitment to workers, uh, to uh, uh, opportunity for everyone. Uh, and it's my um, great you know, honor to be able to work with him. He does veterans issues. He does issue after issue that just kind of goes right to the core of what uh, this city, this region wants to have done. And we thank you uh, for everything that you are doing, uh, 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 Jerry. Uh, and to uh, Michelle, Michelle uh, Dubois, um, uh, a, a, a fighter for immigrant rights, a fighter for environmental justice, a fighter in the spirit of the city of champions, okay? And that's what you have as a legislative delegation up on Beacon Hill. You have these fighters who are willing to stand up for all that you want to be uh, represented and fought for uh, in this uh, community. So we thank each of you for being here. Uh, we thank all the city councilors, school committee, uh, and other leaders who uh, have come here today uh, we have Billy Hill, the president of the Brockton Firefighters. Uh, we have Archie Gormley, Billy Cabral from the Professional Firefighters of Massachusetts. And representing the firefighters right now, just couldn't be here. He, so not that any of these firefighters wouldn't want to be with him, but Matt Paziali is representing us at the Masters right now <laughs> and uh, doing a phenomenal job. So we're, we're so grateful for him being willing to be at the Masters for all of us. So we're here, and I, and I know you're gonna wanna get out of here, so we'll try to get out of here in an hour or so, so you can all go home and see the end of the uh, Masters. Uh, we have uh, Shana Barnes, who is here from uh, the great congressman, of uh, uh, St uh, Steve Lynch's uh, office, so thank you uh, for being here. Uh, again, I partner with Steve Lynch on a daily basis to advance the agenda for uh, the communities down here. And by the way, Donald Trump wanted to zero out the funding for the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities, eliminate all the money. Can I just say that the Brockton High School Concert Choir is living proof that you don't want to cancel out. Because you can see what happens when you make an investment in young people. huh? So you want each one of their natural abilities to come out. Not everyone is anyone. I couldn't do what they did. Okay? I can't be a scientist. Okay? I married one, but I can't be one. You know what I mean? God isn't so good that he lets anybody do everything, you know? But if you're coming through the school system, you can get access to the things that you need uh, in order to maximize your God-given ability. So we don't want to cut out that funding. We want to keep it and enhance it, right? That's really what our goal should be. So, um, so we thank all of you for being here. And um, I would start here with issue number one. Issue number one uh, is gun control. Issue number one 
uh, is listening to these young people in high schools and grammar schools all across our country uh, that we need to follow the children's crusade uh, to finally say to the NRA that we're going to make it stand for not relevant anymore in American politics, right? So, we need background checks so that you can't go on Instagram and buy an Insta gun with no background check. Uh, we, you, need, you need people to not be able to buy guns in gun shows without having a background check. Uh, we need to, in, uh, and I've introduced, uh, but they don't have it in New Hampshire. They, they, no, we, we, we need a national law because of this. When the guns are actually ultimately confiscated by the police, where do they come from? They come from Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, from Georgia, from Florida. Half of the guns in the state, when they're actually confiscated after some event, it comes from other states. So we need national laws. And that's what I was about to say, that in Massachusetts, we have the toughest gun control laws in America, but we need... We need tough gun control laws across the country. So here's, here, here, here is the, here is the, here is the, um, the bill that I'm gonna introduce. If you wanna get a gun license in Brockton, you have to go into the Brockton police station to get the license. 351 cities and towns, 351 police departments that know who should get and who shouldn't get a gun. That's the key reason why we have the lowest crime rate. So I have now, I have now, introduced, I have now introduced that bill as the national law, as, and I call it the Mass Act, the Massachusetts Act for the whole country. And for example, this kid down in Florida, he had been visited 22 times by the police. But he didn't have to go into the police station to get the license. So would that have prevented it? Well, nothing's guaranteed in this life. But it could have reduced the likelihood that people like him and others never do get access to that instrumentality. We also have to simultaneously increase funding for mental health, uh, make sure that we are uh, dealing um, wisely with this interaction between mental health and the access to guns, which can be too easy, uh, which ultimately then plays out on the streets of Massachusetts and the whole country. So we are the leader uh, as we uh, are on so many issues, uh, but we're not happy. We're not happy because we can see it in Brockton, we can see it in other cities and towns across Massachusetts. We need national laws to protect us. The NRA right now has a vice-like grip on the, N, uh, uh, on the uh, United States Congress and uh, House and Senate and the White House. Donald Trump talked tough on the first couple of days, but then he got visited by the NRA and he just started to back down as quickly as he could. It was almost as though Rocky Marciano had walked into the Oval Office. He just backed out, okay? He's not going to take on this political heavyweight champion of the NRA. So we need to now follow these young people to let them be the leaders, to show that we are not going to give up this time, that we know what can happen, but it has to be something uh, on which we from Massachusetts give the leadership. I marched last Saturday for three and a half hours from Roxbury uh, over to Boston Common with 50,000 people. I did not speak, only the young people spoke, which is the way it should be. I marched in the middle of, the, of that procession just like anybody else, following the grammar school kids, following the high school kids, following the college kids. They are giving us the leadership. They want this to end. They want the laws to be put on the books. 
they now are targeted, and now through their leadership, I think we can see it's time for the adults to finally have this be a voting issue. Second issue, opioids. The mayor um, talked about it. Um, it is an epidemic of unbelievable proportions. Uh, I was just down in Atlanta on Tuesday speaking at the National Summit on Opioids. I've gone down there the last four years to speak at the summit. Uh, in Massachusetts last year, um, there was a slight reduction in opioid overdose deaths, but fentanyl is now being found in more than 80% of all of the toxicology results after a death, 80%. So you think prescription drugs, you think heroin, you think cocaine, well, it's now fentanyl. And fentanyl, as you know, is 50 times more deadly than heroin. Can I say that again? Fentanyl is 50 times more deadly than heroin, and now 80% of the victims have it in their system. Why? Why do the drug dealers move towards fentanyl? Very simple. If they spend $6,000 and purchase uh, a kilo of heroin, they can sell it for $80,000. So they invest $6,000, they sell it for $80,000 on the streets of America, the streets of Massachusetts. However, if they spend $6,000 for a kilo of fentanyl, they can sell it for $1.6 million on the streets of our country, the streets of Massachusetts. And these drug dealers are rational economic actors, and that's where they've moved. So we need, um, we need to deal with this issue, and um, if it's not the only bill, it's one of the only bills that Donald Trump has signed that had a Democrat as the lead, and in the middle of January, in the Oval Office, two months ago, Donald Trump signed my bill, and it's a bill that is going to spend about $60 million on devices that can detect fentanyl coming across our borders, coming in in the mail. Uh, that can be given to cities and towns so they can detect the fentanyl uh, at the South Boston Postal Station so they can go through the packaging coming in from Mexico or China, which is where it comes in from. And I stood next to Donald Trump. Donald Trump signed the bill and said, who should I give the pen to that he signed it with? And Republican Senator Rob, Rob Portman from Ohio said, well, it's Eddie Markey's bill, Mr. President. So he handed me the bill. Now. There, there is no Democrat or Republican way of looking at this, but I will tell you that's going to be far more effective than building a $25 billion wall because I'll give you the, it's a crazy number, a package, is a, a, a size of a bag of salt, a, 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 a bag of sugar, can actually provide uh, enough fentanyl for the whole state for three months. So that can just go over the wall quickly. Okay, so we, we're, we're going to need ways of ensuring that we're using technologies uh, in order to detect it. We're going to need to partner with the Chinese government, with the Mexican government. And I keep telling the president that whenever you meet them, that's the first issue you should raise with them. Because if people were dying at the same rate from fentanyl in the whole country as they're dying in Massachusetts, we're only 2% of the population of the whole country. So you can multiply our 2,000 times 50, which would be 100,000 people a year. Two Vietnam Wars of deaths every single year. So failure is not an option. We have to ensure that we're funding detection, enforcement, but we also have to ensure that we fund treatment, that we ensure that the people who need the help get it. And so the mayor took me over to look at the Champions program, which he has for the city of Brockton, it is an absolute model for the state, for the whole country. Uh, we need dramatic increases in funding and in the budget, which we just passed, that uh, President Trump signed, we're going to add $3.5 billion a year for the next two years, $7 billion that can come back into Massachusetts to provide more beds, to provide more treatment, to provide more help for families to be able to deal 
with these diseases. We are not going to incarcerate our way out of this problem. We have to find a way to have treatment to get our way out of this problem. And so that is, for me, uh, at the core of these issues. And I've introduced a piece of legislation called the Milestones legislation. Uh, and it is going to mandate that the Department of Health and Human Services for the whole country has to put together a plan with goals that are measured each year for reducing opioid deaths in our country. And what are the strategies each year? And then at the bottom line, what has happened with those strategies? So each year, we will have milestones, we'll have goals, we'll have a plan that we use that we can see uh, in, and, uh, and ultimately use as our model, okay? So that's, uh, that for me is, you know, at the core of all these, um, of all the issues we're going to deal with. I've never seen anything like this opioid crisis. Uh, it affects inner city. It affects um, uh, the suburbs. Um, and it is, it is just an absolute killer. Uh, in the 1990s, we incarcerated an entire generation of young African American men. Uh, we owe an apology to that entire generation. We, needed, we need treatment. We need medical strategies. We need to deal with this issue. That's where we are right now. On immigration, on immigration, um, the Haitian community is huge in Brockton. It's huge in Malden, my hometown, where I live right now. And we need temporary protect, protected status uh, for the Haitians and for other groups that are here. They are, the, their country is in no condition to welcome back thousands and thousands of people. They still haven't recovered from the hurricane of 2016. They don't have the infrastructure to be able to do it. We should offer protection for these people. And for the, uh, <laughs> for the DACA kids, for the, uh, uh, for these young people, uh, 800,000 of them. They've gone through our grammar schools, they've gone through our high schools, they're now in our military, they're in our universities, um, they're working in companies. Um, uh, to send them back to their countries of origin where they did not actually grow up makes no sense whatsoever. So we tried, we really tried to sit down with President Trump in order to cut a deal which would allow for these 800,000 kids to stay in our country. Why educate them? Why put them in our military and then say they cannot stay here any longer? It makes no sense whatsoever. So, so that, is, uh, that is a big you know, part of what we have to try to resolve before the end of this year, although Donald Trump is now saying that he will not um, negotiate on that issue uh, any longer. Uh, again, these young people now live in homes where they're afraid that a knock on the door or going to church on Sunday or you name it could ultimately result in their mother or father or themselves just being grabbed and taken uh, uh, out of this country permanently. And that is just plain wrong. It's immoral. We have to find a way to resolve this issue. And we have to sit down with the president. He has to be willing to do this so we can find a way out of this conundrum. So I'll mention a couple of other uh, issues, and then if you want, I can take um, some questions for you, uh, from you. Um, uh, we have um, North Korea. The president is about to go and sit down with President Kim in North Korea. I introduced a bill which says that no president can ever use nuclear weapons against a country that did not use nuclear weapons against us. You have to come to the United States House and Senate uh, before you can have a first strike launched by a president of the United States with <laughs> nuclear weapons. We have to make sure that that is something that is uh, well understood. Um, uh, on Facebook, we're going to have um, we're going to have Mark Zuckerberg testify before my committee on Tuesday. Um, 
as many of you know, I demanded that Mark Zuckerberg come and testify before Congress. There is a day of reckoning that has to arrive with regard to what happens to all of this information that young people put online. What are the standards? Uh, and Cambridge Analytica, uh, this company that was funded by, the Mer by Robert Mercer, that Steve Bannon is the vice president, uh, that uh, Michael Flynn was a consultant, gained access to 80 million Americans' Facebook information during the election of 2016. So the American people have a right to know what are the safeguards which are put in place when people are using not just Facebook, but any of these sites. And I believe that there should be a privacy bill of rights online for every American. Number one, that you have the knowledge that the information is being gathered about you. Number two, that you get notice that the information is going to be resold or reused by other parties other than that company with which you originally had been communicating with. And third, you have a right to say no, that you do not want that information to be reused. So it's knowledge, notice, and then no if you do not want it without getting the explicit permission from the individual. That's what I'm going to be asking Mark Zuckerberg about on Tuesday. This issue of what is the right of every American online. When I was a kid, and there was a salesman on the front steps ringing the doorbell, my mother would say, Eddie, just go to the mailbox and say, your mother's not home. And then I went upstairs. I'd say, but Ma, you are home. And she said, I'm not home to him. <laughs> and what these online companies can do is they can get into the living room, into the children, without the parents having an ability then to say, erase that. Stop that information from being resold so that if you have a 13-year-old girl with anorexia, and only the mother and father know about it. But the girl goes online to find out more information about anorexia, and now 20 companies stop bombarding her with ads. What rights should the mother and father have? What rights should the girl have? Right? And I think they should have a right to say, no, stop selling that information to other companies. The girl is just going online to get information. She's not going on there, and I'll be bombarded all day long, because now she can't use the internet. No, she can't use it. That's wrong. So I'm introducing a Bill of Rights for all children under 16 to have an absolute prohibition on it being reused unless you get permission from parents in our country. It is just plain wrong. So that's where I'm going to be on Tuesday, you know, uh, and, uh, and in the couple of weeks after that, we'll have the new chairman of the new Secretary of State coming in. I'm on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So that'll be Mike Pompeo, who uh, will be testifying before my committee. And I'm going to ask him the questions that you want to have asked, since he and Michael Bolton are far more aggressive than their predecessors. Michael Bolton has already said that, um, as the National Security Advisor for the President, that he actually believes in bombing North Korea bombing Iran, and I think we all want to know the answers to what are the consequences of us starting to bomb these countries in terms of the young men and women in our country. The questions must be asked by the elected representative of those who will be making those decisions, and I will do that to make sure that they know that there's going to be accountability if they think they can act uh, without having the Congress, without having the American people be a part of that decision-making process. So again, it's my great honor um, to be here with you uh, in uh, Brockton and uh, in all the surrounding communities. So why don't I just stop right there? And if you want, you can just come up 
to the front here. I think we have a microphone up in the balcony as well. And just come over here and uh, ask the questions. We have Vanessa over here. Uh, we have Nolan over here. Yes. Yes, sir. If you could identify yourself and where you're from. Hi, my name is Derek McIver from Stoughton. Uh, very important issues today. My question is about infrastructure. To get here today, we drove over roll, uh, roads laden with potholes under Can you move, yeah, Vanessa, move in the mic. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, to get here today, we drove over roads plagued by potholes under rusty bridges. We have to ask our employers and our families forgiveness due to the disrepair of our public transportation system. The access and accessibility to our internet is threatened by just few private uh, corporations who hold, uh, who hold the, gate, uh, the keys to the gate there. Um, our fellow citizens in Michigan are drinking polluted water, and in Puerto Rico, they can't even have electricity many months after the, uh, the hurricanes. What are we doing to address these infrastructure issues? Okay, that is a great question. So, the president, if you remember, during the, during the election in 2016, he kept saying, I'm gonna build beautiful bridges, beautiful roads, beautiful airports across the country. So we've been waiting and waiting and waiting in the uh, Congress for the president to deliver the plan. When he delivered the plan, as opposed to all the infrastructure bills, we'll call it the roads and bridges bills of the past, although this also includes rural broadband and other issues that are very important as well, instead of 80 cents for each dollar coming from the federal government and 20 cents coming from the state in Brockton, in his formula, 80 cents will come from the state and the cities and 20% will come from the federal government. Well, if the cities and towns had the 80%, they would figure out how to get the final 20. It's the 80 they have a hard time figuring out. So, so he's, setting up, he's setting up a formula where then his big developer buddies will then say, okay, you know, we'll build it, but then we're just gonna have toll roads. Uh, we'll double the fares on the train going into town. And so you don't have to be a Harvard Business School graduate to figure out what that's going to mean for ordinary people as they get tipped upside down on the toll roads or getting on the train to go to work. So there are certain things that every one of the preceding generations that have lived in our country have done, and that is they've built the roads, they've built the bridges, uh, they've ensured that there is a way for people to uh, be able to transport themselves. So we're going to have a mighty battle on this. I am on that committee. I'm the Democrat uh, from our region on the infrastructure committee. So I'm looking forward to actually sitting down with them to try to find a way to comprehensively for a trillion and a half dollars, which is what I would like to do, for a trillion and a half dollars, have a massive infrastructure building program that would put a million people to work in our country building those roads, building those bridges, <laughs> building out our mass transit. Okay? So that would be my goal. And it's consistent with what we did in December of 2015 when Barack Obama was still president and the Republicans controlled the Congress, but we put together a bill for $250 billion, of which $5 billion came to the state of Massachusetts a billion a year over a five-year period that goes to Governor Baker, goes up to the State House, so that there can be a termination what to do with that billion dollars a year for five years. But this bill that I think we need to pass should be much bigger than that, five, ten times bigger than that bill in 2015, because that's the magnitude of the problem in terms of upgrading the infrastructure in our country. Over here, yes, sir. Good evening, Senator Markey. And thank you for coming to Brockton. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service to the country. Thank you. And your fight for stricter gun control. Thank you. Given the fact that today's version of the Second Amendment allows a person who is not a member of a well-regulated militia, a person whose justification for ownership is not the defense of the state, and a person who is not by its definition bearing arms for a military cause, to own a gun, wouldn't you agree that the original Second Amendment and its purpose has been so misconstrued that it now violates the Ninth Amendment? 
The Ninth Amendment reads, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Our founding fathers would not have written an amendment that would infringe on the rights of others. We all agree that there is no more valuable right than the right to life. It far outweighs the right to a material possession. Will you uphold the Ninth Amendment, Senator Markey? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, would, I would go back to the Second Amendment that you were talking about. As you said, a well-regulated militia. Okay, well-regulated. Now, what does that mean from my perspective? Well, that means you can determine who should be able to get the gun. What's the background check on that person? That's a well-regulated militia. It's not just anyone saying, I need an AK-47. Not anyone saying, I'd like to have a bazooka in my home. Huh? It's a well-regulated. Uh, and so I think we're on strong ground. And actually, it has been upheld. Massachusetts laws have been upheld, even though they've been challenged. Other states have had laws which put regulations on the books that the Second Amendment purists um, oppose. But it's not towards the goal of taking a hunting rifle away from someone. It's towards the goal of saying that someone who shouldn't have a dangerous weapon, as determined by the local police department, should not have it. So we can construct that formula. Excuse me? No, what I'm saying is but the key word here is well-regulated, okay? Well-regulated. And, and, and it slipped out of control. Back in, I'll, I'll tell you what I did in 1994. In 1994, the Chinese were selling one million semi-automatic rifles per year in the United States at $80 a piece, one million a year. I saw that. Bill Clinton, that year, wanted to uh, pass a bill to improve trade with China. So what I did was I gathered 130 members of Congress, I got them to sign on to me, with me, that I then went to President Clinton and I said, these people are not going to support anything that you're doing with China unless you ban those one million a year at 80 bucks a piece of semi-automatic weapons coming into our country. So that was added to the trade deal, and now it's 24 years, 24 million semi-automatic assault weapons at 80 bucks a piece who never came to our country. And I'm very proud of that. Very proud of that. And what we need to do is just keep expanding on it, and I think that what just happened down in the Florida legislature and the Florida governor signing that bill, it doesn't go as far as it should, but it just shows that there's the beginning of a relaxation of that vice-like group uh, grip that the NRA has over the politics in this country. Thank you, sir, for getting it. Yes, yes, sir. Um, I'm concerned uh, both that Trump might do something to cause uh, this Robert Mueller to be fired or for his investigation to be stopped, and I'm also concerned that the special counsel might produce a report um, that has all sorts of damning information about Trump's actions but that congressional Republicans will stick that report in a drawer and we'll never see it. And so what I'm wondering, is what I'm wondering if you can talk about um, what you're doing to prevent that from, what you can do and what you are doing to prevent okay, either of those you. things from happening. Yeah, if, if President Trump fires Robert Mueller, there is going to be a political firestorm that is going to cause a constitutional crisis in our country on a bipartisan basis. It will be Democrats and Republicans who will be saying that's exactly what Nixon did in 1973 in firing Archibald Cox and Elliot Richardson. And it's going to cause a political firestorm. And what we are doing as Democrats is we're trying to work as closely as we can with as many Republicans to have them be saying the same thing. And each time we get another revelation about Cambridge Can uh, Analytica, about the compromise of American information, about the targeting by the Russians of our election, about these indictments and convictions which Mueller has already been able 
uh, to reach, it becomes harder and harder for him to fire Mueller. But we do know that Donald Trump believes that it's a fake news story. And we all know that the Russians tried very hard to compromise the most sacred thing that we have in our country, and that is the right to vote for whoever we want to be our elected representatives. And I am not going to stop until every single piece of information is out in public for the American people to see as to what happened in the election of 2016. And that means I'm going to fight Donald Trump every single day if he tries to shut that investigation down. Let me come back over here. Yes, sir. I'm Richard Kramer from Sharon. By way of background, I'm a father of four daughters, so school safety is very important to me. And as an engineer, I'm trained to, to be analytical, to leave emotions aside and to follow where the facts lead me. And in my responsibilities as president of a local synagogue, I've had security training uh, provided by local law enforcement and by the local FBI agents based out of Boston. And I learned during those sessions that the FBI understands very well the profiles and the, and the motivations of primarily mentally ill perpetrators of the various mass killings. And, uh, you know, we're focusing on gun control. A lot of people would say common sense gun control. But based on the, on the training that I received, particularly the training from the FBI special agents who specialize in profiling and understanding what's driving these perpetrators, it's crystal clear to me that even had all of the gun control that we're trying to accomplish in recent times, had it already been in place, it would have completely failed to prevent any one of the recent tragedies. As an engineer, I'm trained to refrain from doing stupid things. And I can't think of anything more stupid than establishing our schools as gun-free zones and advertising that to mentally ill people, advertising that they can make a big splash in the media, in the national news, if they come into our schools where they're assured success in murdering a large number of inno innocent children. We don't need to turn our schools into armed fortresses filled with armed teachers. As the S FBI experts could tell you, and I hope you'll undertake sometime soon to consult with the experts in this matter, they could tell you that simply ending gun-free school zones would create an uncertainty that an, attack, an attacker could encounter effective resistance if he tried to perpetrate an outrage in a school. And that uncertainty would be a powerful deterrent to the people that are undertaking these kinds of outrages. Okay, so so my, my question to you yeah. is, number one, would you consult with them? And number two, maybe consider that the Second Amendment isn't the problem. Maybe it's part of the solution. Because from my personal perspective, I think we need to end this, what to me is a stupid willingness to continue to sacrifice our inno innocent children on an altar of, of emotional political correctness. Okay, well, and I thank you for that. So, so um, what I would say is this, sir. For the last six years, um, I introduced a bill to have the Centers for Disease Control receive $10 million a year to do the research on the causes of gun violence in America. And for six years, the NRA insisted that the Republicans block that research from being done. That would be the comprehensive research, not anecdotal, but let's do the research. 33,000 people died from gun-related deaths every single year. Now, you might have seen the Boston Globe story uh, on the day before the march, two weeks ago, 
And what it did was it took the Massachusetts laws and it applied it to the other 49 states and, and said what would be the total number of deaths if they had the same tough laws that we had. And the total number of deaths would have gone from 33,000 down to 6,000 for the whole country if they had the toughest gun laws, okay? Just so you understand that. So we already know, it's not just schools, by the way. It's not just schools. It's every other setting as well. It's every other setting. So I do believe we need the research. I do believe that we need to know more about it. They just announced after I had been successful in getting them to clarify that there is no prohibition on doing research at the CDC. That had been the Dickey Amendment, so that got clarified in the budget of two weeks ago, and that was my language that did that. But even with that, they didn't put a nickel into the CDC budget to do any research. So now you can do research, but we don't, we don't have any money. So it's kind of like opioids, you know? It's a, a vision without funding is an hallucination. Right? So if you want to have these scientific answers, if you want to know the answer, then you have to do the research to find out what the causes are. Why are we the highest rate of deaths in the whole world? Why do we compete with Uzbekistan and the Sudan for deaths? Okay, that makes no sense whatsoever. So we know that there are solutions. Massachusetts is the leader, and people who are even in this room still have their guns, even though they live in Massachusetts, if they want to. But we just have the tough laws barring those who shouldn't have the guns from getting them, right? And what we need is every other state to join in that effort. So thank you for being here, sir. Yes, sir. Over here. Yes. All right. Senator Markey, I would like to thank you for your work with Representative Ted Leo of California on the SANE Act, both because it is important on the merits that we prevent the president from launching a nuclear first strike and because it seems to me to demonstrate you understand that Congress has dangerously ceded power to the executive and we need to begin reasserting the constitutional authority to constrain their ability to endanger the American people with capricious policies. Uh, so my two-part question is, in that same spirit of cooperating with your House colleagues to defend Americans against a capricious White House, Will you work with Representative Yvette Clark of New York and Representative Grijalva of Arizona to protect immigrants who currently enjoy temporary protected status and also protect immigrants who are subject to three and ten year bars under the 96 uh, Immigration Reform and Control Act? And secondarily, as we're seeing efforts by Chris Kobach and Attorney General Sessions to abrogate the rights of uh, disproportionately minority Americans to exercise the franchise, will you work with Representative Ellison of Minnesota and Representative Byer of Virginia to combat racist gerrymandering and racist voter ID laws? Yeah, so uh, again, I already made reference first to the bill which I introduced with uh, Congressman Liu from California, uh, barring President Trump from using nuclear weapons if we have not been attacked with nuclear weapons. You, if we started a nuclear war ourselves, I don't think history would be very generous to this generation of Americans. We would not know where it would end. On TPS, temporary protected status, as I said earlier, uh, I've introduced legislation with Chris Van Hollen that creates a path to citizenship for the TPS um, um, uh, 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 refugees, which are in our uh, country right now. Uh, and third, uh, we have to make sure that our elections are not compromised. We have to make sure that we protect the right of people to vote. We know there's a systematic effort that has been put together in order to deny uh, people, Americans, their right to vote. Uh, and uh, we don't want to look back and say that uh, Barack Obama was the last democratically elected president in the United States. We want to learn the lessons of the 2016 election and put the safeguards in place at the state and local level. And if that means going back to paper ballots, if that means just returning to the system that worked for the first 200 years, then so be it. But we have to understand what is happening in our country. There is an attempt to reduce uh, the ability for people who have to have access to the polling places in our country. And I thank you for raising the issue. Over here, yes. Oh, up here. Up here. Yes, sir. Hey, Senator. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, uh, sort of building on what that dude said. Uh, in this upcoming uh, uh, midterm election, I think 
uh, the estimates are like something like 54% of people are going to need to vote for Democrats for them to get 50% of um, representatives in the House. On the uh, other side, uh, in the 2016 election, over a million people voted for Republicans in Massachusetts and have no representatives that uh, represent their point of view. Um, seems to me the obvious solution is to get rid of the uh, winner-take-all system, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Is, it, is there any way that this is ever going to make sense where somebody gets less votes and still wins or still controls massive parts of our government? Uh, there would have to be an amendment to the United States Constitution to change the way in which congressional and senatorial elections and the presidential election are conducted. Um, there is something that was put on the books back in 1789, and so any changes to it that would allow people who didn't get a majority to actually get seats in the United States Senate or the House would be a big debate in the country. I don't think that ultimately, even if I'm unhappy uh, with Donald Trump as president, which I am, that I would want to change the system. I would want to make sure the system works, that it has safeguards. I would want to make sure that democracy did have protections, but I think to say that people who didn't get a majority of the vote should actually have some representation in Congress would be one of the most hard-fought constitutional changes that has ever been debated in the history of our country, and I think at the end of the day it probably is unlikely to be successful. So I'd just be honest with you about that. Yes, over here, ma'am. Good afternoon. Thank you, Senator Maki, for coming tonight today. Um, thank you for all the work that you have been doing in Capitol Hill. So my question today is about DACA and TPS. So, so um, it's about what, I'm sorry? DACA and TPS. Okay. So um, the immigration is in USA been broken for years. And every election, immigration is the centerpiece of all elections. And yes, we blaming um, President Trump so because he doesn't want to work with the Congress. But at the same time, it is Congress' responsibility to work together. We elected you guys for that, so you can work together. Put the partisan uh, aside. You need, bo all parties need to work together to come with a solution about immigration. Otherwise, those uh, recipients of TPS, the recipients of DACA, they are the one that are not living, a they don't have a life. Every day, they are worried. Every day, they don't know what will happen for them. So we want you in uh, Washington to work together and find a solution for immigration. So we don't want to hear a, um, you know, President Trump uh, sign something. Uh, President Obama did sign, and he came and unsigned everything that President Obama been doing. It is your responsibilities, both parties, to work together to find a solution for our immigration system because it has been broken for years. And I think enough is enough when we all of you are going to work together to find a solution. That's what we're asking here in Boston as a majority of us are immigrants. We have families here that's not in hiding. We have families here that are struggling every day about that. Mental health is a problem because they cannot leave. They are under a stress every single day. I am asking you to work with your colleagues in Washington to do something about immigration. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate that. So, you know, when I ran for the United States Senate, you, we all grow up in the house that our mother taught, told our father he was going to have to live in, because the mother picks the home. So, so my mother's from Malden, my father's from Lawrence. I grew up in Malden, that's where my mother lived. So I decided when I announced for the Senate, I would go up and I would ring the doorbell at 88 Phillips Street in South Lawrence to see who lives where my father and his four brothers and sisters and his mother and father who worked in the mills of Lawrence, where did they live? On that first floor of a triple decker in South Lawrence. So I rang the doorbell and the door opened and it was a Dominican family. And the accents were different, but the aspirations clearly the same for that family as for the Markeys on the first floor of that triple-decker. Now, my father's son is a United States senator from the state of Massachusetts. Now, I'm not sure anybody had that on the books when my father was at Lawrence Vocational High School, that his son would be a United States senator, that he was a milkman and his son's a United States senator. 
But I do know that the Dominican family, the Haitian family, the Salvadoran family, in the same way the Irish and the Italian and Jewish families all have the same aspirations for their children. Right? So unfortunately, there are many people in Congress who don't believe that any of them, any of the immigrants should be in America. All 11 million should just be sent out of the country. It's hard to sit down with people to find a common sense solution to a problem when you have these right wing Iowa, Indiana congressmen who are saying none of them should be here. The DACA kids shouldn't be here. No one should be here. So I do want to sit down. That's what we're all about here in Massachusetts. We're about finding ways of common sense solutions to complex problems. That's what makes us the most prosperous state. It's what makes us the healthiest state. It's what makes us the most educated state. It's what makes us the best state. We're only 2% of America, but we're the best 2%. We know that. But it comes by Democrats and Republicans working together. But Massachusetts is not Iowa. Massachusetts is not these other states. They don't want to sit down. We gave a very generous offer to Donald Trump to resolve this issue. We, off we get offered billions of dollars to him for his security goals in terms of policing the border. But in return, we wanted to protect the DACA kids. We wanted to protect others. We want a comprehensive bill in immigration for a pathway to citizenship for these people. And you can't sit down with people who don't even agree that that is an objective that they can consider. So we're not going to give them the money for what they want until they give us what we need on the 11 million who are here. And that's just going to ultimately have to become an election year issue in 2018. And these DACA kids, these DACA kids, the TPS kids, are going to be a part of this election. And I think that um, that's not a bad thing. Let's have a referendum on that in the same way we have a referendum on common sense gun control in our country, on whether or not climate science is real or not in our country, whether or not they should abolish the Affordable Care Act in our country. Let's just have an election on it. Let's let all of these people run on those issues in all these states. And I think the American people are about to give a very rude shock to all of those who don't want to have any resolution of these immigration issues, these climate issues, these health care issues, these gun control issues in our country. And we're only six months from having that day of reckoning, which is what we call Election Day here in America. Over here, yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming, Senator. Rosalie Spickler from Stoughton. I'm going to go off topic a little bit and ask you about your feelings on universal health care. Universal health care, okay, we are the only civilized nation in the world that does not take care of their citizens. We, millions go bankrupt daily because they can't afford their medical bills. Millions die because insurance companies refuse to pay for whatever their needs are. I've, I'm an expat from Canada. And I can tell you personally, the system works well. People are satisfied. I have lived under both systems. Both in Canada, I uh, went into universal health care 50 years ago. People my age have also lived under both. The ones who remember our system do not want to go back to that. They're very, very happy. Their needs are all taken care of. Contrary to what people down here believe, that they are denied. That is not true. I can tell you from personal situations, from my family and from my friends, they have a wonderful, wonderful system. So let me, let me just say that, <laughs> that I do support Bernie Sanders' bill for universal health care. But I would just say this. The Republicans just tried to cut $800 billion out of Medicaid. Uh, and thank God John McCain came out with his thumb down to stop that from happening, to repealing, repealing the Affordable Care Act. If he had been successful, if, if, if Trump had been successful, 2.8 million Americans received their addiction treatment from the Affordable Care Act. 
Can you imagine 2.8 million Americans without treatment for addiction, opioid, alcohol, other in our country? What would happen to those individuals and their families if all that treatment was pulled away from them? So largely, you know, the Affordable Care Act is the safety net. We already proved here in Massachusetts that 90% can, can have coverage. Um, but ultimately, our goal has to be towards you know, a single payer system. Yes, no question about it. But we're gonna have a referendum, and I, I'm a co-sponsor, I'm a co-sponsor of Bernie's bill. But ultimately, uh, uh, this election is gonna help to resolve this. And once we can get enough people elected who don't want to repeal the Affordable Care Act, and that could be as soon as this November, then we can move on to the next stage of the debate, okay? So we gotta focus on this election. Thank you for being okay. here, ma'am. Yes, uh, over excuse here. Me, up here, Senator? up in the gallery, up in the gallery, yes. Ask something. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator. My name is Donald Lesser from Stoughton, and I am a fiscal conservative. I don't like wasting money, especially the taxpayers' money. Now that being the case, and considering we're 20 trillion dollars in debt. That's a two followed by 13 zeros. My question is this, considering that, why does the United States, a country that I'm passionate about, why does it spend as much on military matters as the rest of the world put together? What is the point? Are we trying to conquer the world? What is going on here? Okay. Why do we do this? So, then that's, that is a very good point. The president wants, amongst other things, to have a trillion dollar increase, a trillion dollar increase in our nuclear weapons capacity. Now, we can already destroy Russia, China, North Korea, over and over and over and over and over again with nuclear weapons. What they're looking for is a new generation of nuclear weapons that will be smaller, tactical, and more usable because it won't create the hugest mushroom cloud, it'll just create a small mushroom cloud, and from the military planner's perspective, that makes them more usable. I say, it just makes the whole situation more insane that they think they're gonna actually have nuclear weapons, which our Pentagon is gonna use in a war fighting situation. We should be trying, thank you, sir, for asking this question. We've gotta to go to the table with the Russians. We've gotta to go to the table with the Chinese on the military buildup in the construction of useless nuclear weapons and other weapons and try to find a way which we can end it so each of the countries can spend more money on that which makes them more safe. If we're gonna be losing 100,000 people to fentanyl every year, a million people over 10 years, you know, to that one drug, maybe we need to redeploy the money over to where Americans are vulnerable, where their family member could be killed, huh? Instead of wasting it on more nuclear weapons. So Senator Dianne Feinstein and I are going to introduce amendments in June to the defense uh, authorization bill in which we're going to start trying to kill each one of these unnecessary nuclear weapon systems. We need a big national debate in our country as to whether or not we are safer or less safe with no more nuclear weapons in our nation. Over, uh, over here, yes ma'am. Hi, um, I'm a member of Moms Demand Action and I wanna thank you for your advocacy for common sense gun legislation. Thank you. My question is, I can't read. <laughs> um, what are the chances of concealed carry reciprocity passing in the Senate, undermining the common sense gun laws in Massachusetts and the other states with strong gun laws? And what are you prepared to ensure that it doesn't ha pass? Yeah, so this is a law which Republicans want to have a vote on, I think they're afraid to have it in Washington, that would allow for concealed weapons to be brought into Massachusetts if it's legal in another state, even if our state doesn't want to have, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So right now they're afraid to have that vote after the Parkland 
um, disaster. Um, again, we should have a right to have our own laws in Massachusetts. We should have a right to decide how we want to govern. The gentleman mentioned the Ninth Amendment. Huh? So we should have a right to be able to govern ourselves uh, it, with regard to how much ex extra protection we want to give to our citizens on, on top of the national laws. So I'm going to fight that every single step of the way. If there's one thing that the police, the, I'll tell you, I'll tell you who the biggest advocates for this are. It's the police chiefs. They don't want concealed carry coming into our state. They want to know who's got the guns. They want to know what's going on. So, so to the extent to which that they want to uh, you know, have us be um, guided by other states, then that would be um, or something that I would fight for. So let me just let me just say this right here. Um, we got started just a little bit late, uh, and we wanted to hear a couple of extra songs from um, uh, the, uh, the Brockton High School kids. So I'll tell you what, we'll go until 5.15, that's 11 minutes, and I'll try to give very concise answers for the next 11 minutes, because I want to be respectful of all the people who thought they were coming here until just 5 o'clock. So I'll just try to answer as quickly as I can. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, thank you for coming here, Senator, to a majority minority community. Uh, my name is Josh Callahan, I'm from Raynham. Um, I have two very quick questions. There can be yes or no answers. Uh, do you unequivocally condemn the murder of Palestinian protesters by the IDF? And do you support the abolition of ICE, which has only been around for 13 years? Thank okay. you. Uh, I, would, uh, I would say that we need to have, thank you, a full investigation of what took place there so we can understand on both sides what happened. That was an extremely provocative situation. Um, I think that uh, we have to make sure that uh, ICE doesn't get turned into uh, something that is just knocking on the doors of innocent families where no crime has ever been committed by any member of that family. That's what was the promise that was made to us. They were going to go after the bad hombres, and what we now have are families that have never committed any crime ever in all the time that they've been in our country who are now afraid that ICE might start to knock on their door as well. That's absolutely wrong, and we have to put constraints on ICE's ability to terrorize uh, every single family, especially the DACA families uh, where these kids haven't done anything wrong. In fact, DACA should really s stand for deserves a chance in America. That's what DACA should really stand for. Okay, that's what it should really stand for. Yes, uh, uh, up here, yes. Quick, we have 10 minutes left to go. Yes. Yes, um, my name is Mozart Sincere. And the question that I have is, if we, if we change that the current government has, the first thing they want to do is to cut funding for education for our kids. What, what do you guys do when the government do whatever they want as far as Congress to make sure no matter what they do, you don't cut funding for the kids because at the end of the day, kids that live in cities like Brockton end up, end up paying the price. Okay, good. That's a great question. So, um, <laughs> Betsy DeVos is Donald Trump's Secretary of Education. Their budget was to cut funding for education by 18%, okay? So the Democrats stood up in this budget. We said, you're not cutting the budget for education. If anything, we need to increase it. I am, you know, again, my father drove a truck for the Hood Milk Company. Am I smarter than my father? I am not smarter than my father. Am I smarter than my mother? I am not smarter than my mother. Will I ever work as hard as my father, the milkman? I will never work as hard as the milkman worked getting all the milk bottles out there by 5, 6, and 7 a.m. on the doorsteps, okay? And for you young people, milk actually used to come to people's house, okay? <laughs> Just so you know, that's a, it's a long time ago, but that's how it used to be. So I'm up here only because I got access to education. But could I have gone without student loans? No. Could I have gone without Pell Grants? No. I needed help, okay? Blue collar, poorer families, they need help to maximize their God-given abilities because their abilities are just as great as any kid living out in the suburbs, okay? I know this. So if there's one thing I will never compromise on, because that's the reason I am up here, is the guaranteed access to the funding to have. And Brockton is a perfect community that needs more help, more funding for education. They're already doing a great job, not, but they would do so much better if they had the funding to be able to do that job. Over here, yes, we have 
Yeah. Eight minutes left to go. Uh, my question is this. The president continues his tweeting and affects the stock market almost every other week with a drop of 400, 500 points, et cetera. He's attacked individual companies such as Amazon, et cetera. Why isn't the SEC investigating him? Ah. Why isn't that happening? Someone is making money off of these things, and long-term investors are taking the hit. So please pursue that. That's excellent. SEC investigate the president yeah. and his friends. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that's, that's a very good point. I mean, be, before the rest of us are awake in the morning, the president might have already started a trade war, uh, a, uh, a real war, you know, a collapse of an entire sector of the American economy uh, with people panicking. Uh, but you are right. I mean, we don't know what his full interests are, which is why, by the way, we cannot stop the lawsuit against the president until we find out what all of his holdings are. He doesn't think the American people have a right to know where his financial interests are. We have to pursue this lawsuit all the way until we find out, in fact, how he does make his money and if he is worth as much as he says he is. But but you're right, he could capitalize upon this. Yes, ma'am, we have seven minutes left to go. Hi there, I'm going to start with a joke. My name is Denise Cabral from West Bridgewater, and I, according to family legend, have enough Indian blood in me to say, all of you can either leave or everyone can stay. <laughs> That's not what I came to talk about, though. I wanted to make you aware of continuing proposed legislative attacks by animal wrongs extremists on animal owners and breeders in this country. You at least have the elephant in the room bill before you right now. If you look at it carefully, if your staff looks at it carefully, it basically bans animal fairs, rodeos, um, educational programs, all of our traditional historical shows and exhibitions. Please don't support these efforts okay. to put us out of business. Great, thank you. I don't think I'm a co-sponsor of that bill, so I won't get on there. I'm going to study it, and maybe you could talk to my staffer afterwards so I can learn more about the bill. Thank you for coming. Yes. Hi, Senator Martin. Thank you for being here. I consider this an opportunity of a lifetime to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Um, well, Nolan just informed me that the three-page handout that I've been handing out today, you didn't get a chance to see, which is unfortunate. But many crimes and cover-ups have been committed against me. And every politician, lawyer, media outlet, and the world knows all about it, and it has for years, but now one person has lifted a finger to help me to find justice. Um, so I had two questions for you. One was, is, was my paper written clearly enough so that you can understand it? And two, am I doing something wrong or are they? But you, you won't know that until you read my Okay, paper. so here's what I'm going to do. Um, Nolan is on my staff, so you're going to talk to Nolan in four minutes as soon as this is done. Give him the paper, give him your documentation, tell him the whole story, and then I will learn this whole story, uh, and I will try to get you the answer you want, okay? So that is what Thank I you, will sir. try to do for you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you for very coming. Much, much appreciated. We have four minutes left to go. Yes, sir? All right. Hi. Uh, my name is Chris Jones um, from Abington. Um, you voted against the tax bill, the Republican tax bill, they call it. Um, and the whole time this tax bill was being worked on, we were being told that the regular blue collar worker was going to be paying more in taxes. Now I did do some research as best I could about this, and I do know that another one of the statements was that the rich will only get richer, but the blue collar will be paying, and the blue collar will be paying more taxes. I don't care about the rich. The rich are gonna do what they're gonna do. They're gonna get rich, they're gonna get poor, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. I care about the blue collar worker, and all the blue collar workers here. I do know now that I've received a raise in my pay, not from my employer, but from the federal government, because this bill passed. I did my due diligence, and I found out for the next eight years, I will get an increase in my pay because I would be paying less state taxes. Well, 
Here, I think the point my, that you're my making is My question is, why did you vote against it? Oh, oh yeah, I will tell you, because your tax bank phases out over the next 10 years. The corporation's tax breaks are forever in this tax break. So you got your much smaller tax break now, but it phases out. The corporations got a huge tax break, even when unemployment was at historically low levels. Uh, and there was no economic justification for the magnitude of this tax break. Wealthy people saw their taxes reduced from 39% down into the 20s, when one thing we know is that the wealthy in our country making a million or more need no help right now, especially if it's going to come at the expense of health care and education programs in our country. So you are right in that sense, but the larger sense is yours is going to phase out, and the corporations is not going to phase out. That's what I was saying. Why don't we treat the corporations the way we treat people? Because the corporations, in Donald Trump's mind... You could put a law in effect that would make it permanent. Excuse me? You could put a law in effect that could make that permanent. Oh, that's permanent. what we're going to do. When we win the presidency in the House and Senate, that's what the Democrats are going to do. <laughs> we're going to make sure that they pay their fair share and the millionaires pay their fair share. Absolutely. Yes, over here. We're down to the final question. Right over here. Senator Markey, I'm a mother of four sons. I'm a black woman with four black sons. Um, when all is said and done, investigations are complete, and it is found that these black men are being unarmed and shot to death and bleeding out on the street. Can you please pass a bill? that will make it an automatic crime for these police officers to kill us and complete with jail sentences to get these criminals off the streets. Well, thank you for um, raising that issue. Uh, we clearly need to ensure that uh, we have justice, which is done in our country that no one is immune, um, that there are body cameras on police, that, um, that we get to the bottom of every one of these crimes, that every American is entitled to the full protection of the Constitution under the law, and no one is exempt. And so that is what I promise to you, because black lives do matter. All lives matter, though, but Black Lives Movement has actually begun to focus upon this issue, and I think it's absolutely critical that we do so, and I thank you for raising it here today, and we have to make sure that, um, that none of these crimes get kind of swept under um, the rug, that no one who dies uh, uh, unnecessarily uh, is allowed to be forgotten. So I thank you for raising the issue. And although I said you were the last one, and I wanted to honor that, we have one more over here, and the gentleman is yes, absolutely, uh, huh? So I agree with you 100%. How are you doing? Very good. We are, we are very satisfied because you are doing great job for Massachusetts. You are a good man. I respect you. You are doing good job in Congress. Oh, okay. Slow down, I'll do it. Okay. Can you all understand him? I'm having a little trouble. My okay. accent is Portuguese, no? My accent is Portuguese. But uh, let me go slowly. I appreciate you. Just slow down. Slow I, ap down. I, ap I appreciate your presence here. So you are doing an excellent job. Not now, but you've been doing all along. And uh, we appreciate you. So I have some gift here for you. Because I, my first job in the world was working for government. So I have a special CD here that I dedicate to God. Pre uh, 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 to God and uh, uh, Pope Francis, President Obama, members of Congress and Supreme Court of the United States of America. Nobody ever did before. So this is for you, and we have one here for Supreme Court. Okay. And Thank Mr. you, Bush. sir. Thank you so much. I'll do my book report. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. One final, quickly, thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Okay. I'll cut back what I was going to say. The ascension in the Trump administration. I figured out what it is. It's called trial by fired. 
but I would like to ask you if you would consider, because we need to plan for the future, we need to prepare the young people we're all looking to as our, so to speak, saviors in government. We need more courses to be mandated, at least one in every high school four-year period, about learning about the U.S. government, how our government works, and how a bill becomes a law, so that when they're ready to step up, they know how to do it. Thank you. So, thank you. Now, so Massachusetts knows how our government works. And because we pretty much invented America, right? We pretty much invented it beginning in 1775 with Paul Revere's ride. Huh? No taxation without representation. The revolutionaries came from Brockton and all the surrounding communities saying to King George, we will not live under your laws if you do not give us a member of the House and Senate to vote in Parliament on those issues. No taxation without representation. We were the revolutionaries. The abolitionist movement, it started here. We were the revolutionaries. The suffragette movement, it started here. We made the government work. We were the revolutionaries. The Affordable Care Act revolution, it started here. We were the revolutionaries. The Freedom Riders leading, leaving from Boston Common to go down to the South in the 60s, we were the revolutionaries. So here we are in 2018. We know how democracy works. We can see young people, how talented they are up on the stage. We see young people, they're activists now, marching by the millions across the country to make the government work, to take it back from adults who have not, in fact, protected them from climate change, or guns, or opioids, or issue after issue. So you are right. We need to take this time to ensure that people once again understand what democracy is all about, how laws are made. And ultimately, it comes from people willing to stand up, people willing to have their voices heard, people like today willing to come out on a Sunday afternoon to hear their United States Senator take questions from them, which is the way our government should work. It's my great honor to represent all of you. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you all.